This is The Porter's Parable by Captain Vesorius. By the holy graces of our Lord, after serving in the monastic cell at Monte Corona for fifteen years, I, Don Galando Lamberto, was awarded the position of porter by the venerable abbot Bonus de Tijas. I have always envisioned that our small cell stands in direct contrast with the terror of Mount Vesuvius, which lies across the cityscape of Napoli. We are the holy defenders to the gates of heaven upon God's holy mount, Monte Corona. As Tartarus lies beneath the behemoth volcano, dormant and waiting to fling its destruction once again upon the world. The abbot has always been in my mind the chief porter to the kingdom of heaven here in our cell, and now as his cloistered porter, I will hold some tiny part of that responsibility. With this new duty given to me, I vowed to protect my brothers and the sanctity of our cell. It was strange to receive visitors after dusk, but on my first week of duty, a ship lazily pulled into the harbor of Napoli late in the day, with three travelers from the east bound for our cell. The first to arrive knocked loudly on the door with his foot. As I was in the newly built gatehouse attached to the porter's cell, I heard the commotion and quickly went to see who had made their way up the switchback path to our cloistered cell, calling out, Thanks be to God! But I received no response. Opening the gate, I was greeted by the sight of a large man in rich robes with his servant. His large face was beaded with sweat from the climb up the hill. He revealed himself to be a priest sent by the famous patrician Theodosius in Constantinople to a gathering of bishops in Rome. His servant with him carried his bags, but kept to himself, not speaking any Latin, but only Greek. I greeted them both with the peace of our Lord and invited them into our sacred home as guests. Showing the priest whose name was Palladius to the guest house, he and I prayed together as the abbot was currently in the middle of Vespers' lecture with the rest of the monks in the oratory. I prepared a bowl of water and washed the dust from his feet, saying, we have received thy mercy, O Lord, in the midst of thy temple. However, when I turned to the feet of his servant, Palladius snapped at me. Oh, I've had enough of this Italian buffoonery. Take me to the abbot, or bring him here. I cannot stand another moment of your pouring about. Then bring some hot food. We will starve to death if you don't hurry yourself. I will hurry, with the grace of our Lord, I replied. It had been quite some time since words so sharp and harsh had pierced my ears, but I intended to comply with the priest's wishes quickly, rushing out the door. Their bellies would have to wait, and I was the only monk in our small cell assigned to preparing food for our guests. Leaving the guest house, I ran up the path towards the oratory, just as a heavenly sound began to waft from the structure. The other monks had begun the Vespers hymn, what glory there is in holy words sent up to God the Father. However, before I could run ten paces out of the guest house, there was another knock at the gate. This time, the foot knocking was softer, almost timid in its calling. Turning about, I ran to the gate and called out again. Thanks be to God! This time I received an answer, but could not make out the words, though I did discern a Christus amid a heavy foreign accent. I opened the door to reveal a road-weary monk, his wild hair stuck out in many strange directions as the stink of sea travel hit my nostrils like the fumes of Mount Vesuvius. Greeting him with the peace of our Lord, I invited him in also, though I was suspicious of his attire. He seemed to me to be a wandering monk. This is the worst kind of monk, who roam the countryside looking for poor peasants to swindle for a few nights food and rest. However, he claimed his name was Iapagos and to be from a far-off monastery on the border of Scythia, which his accent attested to as he spoke uh, Latin with an atrocious drawl. Begrudgingly, I led him to the oratory to join the other monks in Vespers' hymn. The heavenly chorus had lulled slightly as we approached the oratory, which sat atop a small rise in the midst of our monastery. I led him around to the side door near the dormitory and quietly led him in as another glorious crescendo in music burst forth from my brother's lips. The candlelit chamber was filled with God's most holy praises by my brethren, but they were not alone. 
as the strange bedraggled monk beside me had begun to sing with them. His voice came in most unearthly tones that have ever touched my ears. I was spellbound while he sang, losing all track of time and space as the majesty of our Lord shone through him. The heavenly chorus sung to the shepherds on the first Christmas was revealed to me anew. Never had I heard such beautiful sounds, much less from such a meek and mild being. We were blessed upon this day to have such wondrous song emerging from humble lips. I introduced Diophagos with a heavenly voice to the rest of the cell, and he was greeted kindly by the abbot, and welcome to stay with us as long as he desired. Remembering my duties, I then quickly led the abbot to the guest house to meet priest Palatius. However, coming down the hill from the oratory, we found the gates to the monastery swinging wide open. The creak of the hinges was grating upon my ears, a sharp contrast to the splendid songs of vespers. I rushed to the guest house, fearing for our priestly visitor's safety, but upon entering, I found that neither the priest nor his servant remained, nor was the reliquary cross which stood upon the mantel of the guest house nor the fine silver which we stored in the cabinet, nor in any of the rich gifts which we had diligently collected from the ruins of the old church. The only item left to us was a painted icon of Madonna and Child. I, Gangalando Lamberto, write these words and leave them here for my successor, that he may learn from my most unworthy nature of the duties of a porter. May the grace of the Almighty shine down upon him.